You know how it is. Things get hyped, hopes get high, and all we get is disappointment. New Year's Eve always sucks. Seahorses are too small to be ridden, and car makers turn this into this. Hey everyone, I'm Stipe. And in this episode, plastic melons, a butcher, and the top seven most disappointing cars ever made. Let's do this. Number seven. At the turn of the millennium, retro cars were all the rage. Fiat brought back the 500, BMW resurrected the Mini, and the muscle cars were back in full swing. But nothing compares to the excitement when Plymouth unveiled a modern hot rod, the Prowler, because, well, would you just look at it? I actually think that the Prowler looks too cool. You need a persona of Tony Stark to pull off this look, or otherwise you'll just end up looking like a douche that's trying too hard to get noticed. But that's not the only disappointing thing about the Prowler. It also isn't a hot rod, not even close. There's a V6 under the hood, and that's a huge no-no. It should have been a torquey V8, maybe even two. What else? Open the doors and you're greeted with more plastic than if you open the door of the Playboy Mansion. Again, no. And lastly, the gearbox is automatic. I can't stress this enough. Hot rods are not cars. They're mechanical machines with some wheels and seats stuck to them. You don't drive them, you operate them. You control the torque, the revs, you slide the selector between cogs, engage the clutch, move things around. It's part of the experience that you just don't get in the Prowler. Not even close. What a shame. Number six. Okay, let's get this out of the way. I, like many others, also don't think that the new Supra is good enough. When you look at the top dogs of the 90s Japanese sports cars and how they evolved, it's hard not to feel let down. Skyline dropped its name and the whole supercar industry on its knees. The NSX was dubbed a baby 918. And Supra, it went from embarrassing Ferraris and everyone else on the drag strip to being a rival to a four-cylinder Cayman. Progress! It also doesn't look right. Where's the iconic big wing? Where's the length? Where's the girth? This car is actually smaller and less imposing than the old one. That's not right. But the worst part is that it was based on the BMW Z4. I'm not saying that BMW can't make a good sports car, far from it, but you don't expect to find yourself looking at the BMW interior when you buy a Japanese car. Also, the BMW engine. Because Supra is based on the softish Z4, it got a softer engine as well. A straight six that tops out at 380 horsepower is a far cry from a different BMW straight six with 500 horsepower found in the M4. Actually, when you think about it, the LFA was a proper Supra, geeky in that Japanese way, and with a legendary engine that puts supercars to shame. Not this. Number five. Look, I'm not gonna rip on Mitsubishi for putting the sports car name on their newest SUV. It's a dick move for sure, but can we really blame them for trying to make a profit? Go ahead, do your SUVs, make a lot of money, but you have to give me something else to be excited about, something worth fanboying about, something that will something. What the hell? The Mirage was supposed to make me a fan of your mark and tattoo your logo? After decades of innovation, conquering the rough terrains, as well as the tracks, this little piece of crap is the only car Mitsubishi has to offer if you aren't buying an SUV. And you know a car is not meant for greatness when it's the cheapest car on the US market. Mirage is not about what it can give you to get you excited, but what to take away without you getting too mad about it. And to think about all the great cars Mitsubishi used to make. GTO, Starion, Eclipse, Galan, and lastly, the Evo. What hurts the most is that the Evo was discontinued right about the same time when this crap mobile was introduced. Like, Evo is dead, but here, what do you think about this one? Well, f*** your Mirage and anything that looks like Mirage. There. Usa. Usa. Number four. In case you didn't know, Volkswagen invented the hot hatchback segment with the first-generation Golf GTI. It offered all the practicality and affordability of a regular car, but thanks to the extra power, it was exhilarating to drive as well. Things weren't quite the same with the fourth-generation GTI. The desire to make Golf a more premium car than all the other rivals resulted with gaining a lot of weight. This, together with the not-so-lively engine and softer steering, meant that the new GTI was heavily criticized when it was launched. Many called it slow, boat-like, and flaccid. Even the chairman of VW wasn't a fan of it. Fatality. Depending on the market, GTI was offered with as low as 115 horsepower, but mostly it had a 1.8 turbo with 150 horsepower, which was good for a 0-60 to time in 8.3 seconds. 
that's on par with the previous version, but because the power was delivered so linear, it didn't feel faster. It simply wasn't a joy to rev it high. But the worst was its sluggish feeling when driving. The extra weight made it sway a lot more in the corners. Quality materials and extra padding isolated most of the outside noise, and steering felt numb. Basically, the Mark IV GTI was as exciting as listening to Coldplay, which is why it went down in history as the worst GTI Golf ever. Number 3 The F8 is a great car, but what it does is very disappointing. First of all, no one was really expecting it. I remember when it was unveiled and it left me confused. Wait, is this yet another 488 one-off for some rich client or a fully new model? The current car was still fairly new. I haven't even seen a single review of the hardcore Pista, and it's already time to move on? It also had the same power output and performance numbers as the Pista, which I'm sure made all the owners of the special edition car feel very unspecial indeed. Way to go, Ferrari, cannibalizing your own models. But that's not all. Tributo is the third iteration of Ferrari 458, and the ugliest one by far. Look at all the bulges, the cuts, the ribs, and blades, and, well, it's just a mess. If I was designing it, F8 would have looked much cleaner and elegant, something like this. Hashtag bring back pin and farina. So why is Ferrari doing this? Why unveiling it so quickly? I can only imagine it's because McLaren is kicking their butt when it comes to performance, and Ferrari was like, quick, put a different name on the Pista, call it a new base model, so we can compete with the 720S. Well, good luck chasing the new 765 LT now, you jealous cannibals. Number two. BMW was riding high in the 90s. Cars were great, sporty, pretty, and so cool that even James Bond was driving them. Who could ever forget the BMW 007 series, also known as the prettiest BMW ever made? But there was a problem called Chris Bangle, BMW's new chief designer, and this guy really wanted to take the design in a different direction. First car to do that with? The successor to the aforementioned 7 series. Okay, let's have a look. Ugh! What the hell is that? What's with the fat body, the protruding butt, and what's with the drooling headlights? It's like the car knows it's ugly and is sad about it. Oh, what have they done to me? Nothing that made the previous car look so pretty was present anymore. The old one was large, yes, but also slim and athletic, which made it look lower and wider. This one is just obese. The reception among largely older and more traditional buyers was so bad that they actually rushed to buy the predecessor while they still could. It also didn't help that the 7 Series introduced a frustratingly complicated iDrive multimedia system that only teenagers understood how to use. The last thing to point out, Adrian von Hoidonk, the current BMW lead designer slash butcher, was also involved in the E65 design process. Will these Bavarians ever learn? Number 1 I know it's a McLaren, but this has to be said. Speedtail is not as impressive as they made you believe. I was super excited when rumors came out that McLaren is doing a spiritual successor to the F1. It will be focused on sheer speed, not lap times, and it will have the driver's seat in the middle. Awesome. And then the photos came out. Oh my god. It's so ugly. The rear is sexy, I'll give it that. But what's with the awkwardly shaped tall roof and Down syndrome looking front? Yeah, okay, it's supposed to be fast and cut through the air super efficiently. It's fine. Impress me with the numbers then but I'm afraid there's nothing impressive about it. Top speed is 250 miles an hour, which is a lot, but only 10 miles per hour more than the old F1, and still less than the Veyron, a car from 15 years ago that had less power. If you will be an F1 successor, I expect you to leave everything else in the dust for years to come. Isn't that why Speedtail looks like an eel sperm in the first place? But I'll give you another chance. Being aero-efficient doesn't make a difference only at 250 miles per hour. It'll also help you get there sooner because there will be less air resistance pushing you back. And here, all that sophisticated space-age technology and the weird lines make a huge difference. It does 0 to 186 miles per hour in 12.8 seconds, which is blisteringly fast, but again, slower than a completely unsophisticated car from Texas, the 2016 Venom GT. All it took Hennessy to beat McLaren is a small plastic car, twin turbo V8, and lots of power. Why complicate it? And I'm not even done here. The interior is also disappointing. Look at the dashboard and all those screens. In a $20,000 VW Polo, you get a screen that follows the contour of the dashboard. It's nice, but the best they can do in a million dollar car is this? No, no, this is not good enough. And that's the list, but let's add more to making it even 10.
can you guess him? Which disappointing cars would make up your list? Leave a comment down below, get your name in the credits by supporting me on Patreon, subscribe, and yeah, I'll see you in the next one.